sustainability. I'll just quickly introduce myself. My name is Lata. I'm chairing today's symposium. I'm from the Energy IRC here at the university. Um, sorry, I just moved my slides on. Um, we've got our program of speakers today. We've got three keynote speakers, Professor Marcus Kraft, Professor Srini Vasan Geshev, Professor Jennifer Gabries, and we've also got some early career researchers, Yen Fang Su, Scott Jean, Joyce Lynn Longdon, and Simon Thomas. And I re really hope that you enjoy their talks. Just a little bit of housekeeping, please keep your microphone muted, but you can keep your camera on if you like. Um, and please do use the chat function to submit any questions that you have to the speakers. Um, and you can submit them anytime during the talk and then I'll read them out at the end or you're very welcome to raise your hand at the end of the talks to um, talk to the speaker directly. And if we run out of time, then please speakers do pop into the chat box and then you can give written answers to some of the questions if we don't have time to answer them during the session. And just to remind you that this session is being recorded and it's going to be available on YouTube afterwards. Um, this is just one in a number of research symposia that have been run by Cambridge Zero this term. The next week one is on hard to abate um, sectors uh, on the 24th of November and you're very welcome to sign up to that as well. And if you want any more information on different activities going on in Cambridge Zero, then do sign up to our mailing list too. And you can follow us on social media. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to stop sharing now and I'm going to introduce our first keynote speaker. That's Professor Marcus Kraft. Marcus is the head of the Com Computational Modeling Group at the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology. And his talk is uh, entitled Intelligent Decarbonization and the World Avatar Project. So Marcus, please do uh, share your slides. Right. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you are well. Uh, let me know if you can see my slides. Is that possible? Okay, good. Great. Anyway, um, thank you very much for, uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you all. Um, I'm in Singapore. It's um, now 11 o'clock in the evening. Um, I'm very pleased to have you as my evening um, entertainment. Um, I want to talk about intelligent decarbonization and the World Avatar Project. Um, I, I will show results from the Cambridge Cares Project, from my company CMCL Innovation, and from the computation modeling group here in the Department of Chemical Engineering. Right, a short uh, remark uh, to computation modeling Cambridge Limited. This is a spin out company that I started in 2008. And um, uh, we are now working um, on, on, on knowledge graph visualization. We used to do a lot of automotive um, work and still do. Um, um, so at the moment, CMCL is um, involved in the National Digital Twin Project, in particular in a, in a project called Credo. And I'll say something about this later. But in my main uh, function, I'm director of CARES. Um, CARES um, was established in 2013 as a platform for collaboration between Cambridge and Singapore. So it's a research laboratory here in Singapore owned by the University of Cambridge. We work together with Nanyang Technological University and National University of Singapore and other Singapore institutions to do research that is sort of relevant for both University of Cambridge and Singapore. There are many other uh, universities with uh, good names in um, our program, MIT, Berkeley, for example, ETH Zurich, and so on. To the left, you see the Marina Bay Sands Hotel um, and the bay. Um, so, what this is what uh, Singapore looked like before. COVID. Right. And one of the programs we host is a program called C14, that's Cambridge. Center for Carbon Reduction Chemical Technology. Here, we aim to investigate and develop technologies um, for the reduction of the carbon footprint, mainly in the chemical industries 
in Singapore, um, one uh, specific area is here on Ireland, there's an enormous industrial park. There's something that very few people actually know about. Now, Singapore um, uh, is governed by the Prime Minister, Yi Tien Long, who's actually a Cambridge graduate. And not just that, he's a, he was a senior wrangler from Trinity and the son of Lee Kuan Yew, and he runs Singapore. He's definitely a clever guy. And he says that the consequences of climate change are catastrophic and affect all countries. And Singapore is especially vulnerable um, because mainly um, of the rise of sea levels. And for Singapore, this is an existential threat. So here we go, existential risk, climate change. Um, I think many of us have seen this. It's now quite popular and um, uh, it couldn't be more direct. So the, the color of the lines represent the average temperature in a particular year, and you can clearly see how this is rising. So the question I want to address in the first part of my talk is, can AI help uh, mitigate climate change? And of course, yeah. Yes. And one um, example for exa uh, is um, the energy use for server cooling um, has been reduced significantly by using uh, Google DeepMind machine learning. Um, and uh, this is an example where, uh, you know, optimization through machine learning was very successful. Now, of course, you could argue that. Um, if you have not the computing center, you wouldn't have to do emission in the first place. But of course, just like electric with cars, we assume like magic, electricity is carbon footprint free. Hopefully it will be soon, but that is a matter of another talk. For now, I assume um, electricity um, is free. Right, so what you then can do, you can sort of look into um, the potential um, of saving greenhouse gases. And you could look at different sectors, for example, building solar, wind, and so on. And more than 10 years ago, McKinsey uh, came up with this uh, Marshall abatement cost curve. And you see on the y axis, the abatement cost, and on the left, uh, the right, so the x axis, the abatement potential. And um, for example, in the building area, if you use uh, the new LED light bulbs, um, the, the actual cost that you have is negative, which means the, 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 the investment is so low that the OPEX very soon catches up with it and you actually make money. Unfortunately, this is not for all technology the case. So for example, hybrid electrical vehicle, um, the cost is much larger, but then in turn, the, the abatement um, potential is also large because a light bulb, let's face it, doesn't use that much energy, although there are quite a number of them. Now, so in our work, we, we have done sort of an analysis and looked at different costs and basically try to um, assess the impact of digitalization. That means basically also sometimes called industry for right? no, uh, zero internet of things. What happens if you connect everything to one another? Are there potential savings? And on top of it, once it's connected, you could, of course, use some AI magic optimization. And um, of course, uh, you would then be able to achieve better results. And this is what this graph is showing. Um, so um, you can basically um, uh, increase the abatement potential by up to 50% if you. Um, use digitalization and, and AI techniques. Right, and then the next question is, of course, um, what, what is the impact on the economy? And, and if you go out and, and, and start reading material, you see um, a study by PricewaterhouseCooper and Microsoft, and, and they estimate uh, the, an increase of 7% 7, 7 on the global GDP. So um, in short, um, uh, AI digitalization has the potential to help us, um, of course, always assuming um, 
that we do get um, greener electricity and burn less carbon fuels. Um, and so just I just gave you a few very superficial examples, but if you want to know more about this, um, my co-author Oliver Inderwilde and I, we basically put this compendium on intelligent decarbonization together, where we look at technology, impact, implication, incubation, and uh, work with a number of academic partners. If you look at the list, you'll see uh, many well-known faces uh, with a number of companies uh, that are quite big NGOs, um, particularly I'd like to mention here, GoAsia um, and government, um, that all, all these uh, people contributed towards the book um, under the overall label intelligent decarbonization. The book um, will come out um, before Christmas. So, you know, if you don't know what to buy for Christmas, here you go, right? Um, anyway, so this is the book, Intelligent Decarbonization. The second part of my talk, I would like to um, give you a quick snapshot of what AI technology we are working on. The main purpose for doing this, I'm mean, like in the first part, I sort of uh, argued, okay, AI and carbonization are not foes. They can be friends. There can be a, 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 a good effect. Uh, now, I, you know, when people say AI, they normally mean machine learning or deep learning and, 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 and using some Python routines. This is not what I'm going to talk about. For us, uh, AI are knowledge graphs. And we have, this, we have this universal digital twin, which we believe is the digital twin of all digital twins. And we call it the world avatar twin. And then the historical name is the j -Park simulator, completely misleading, um, which we um, used because our first uh, study object was the Jurong Island Industrial Park. Right, what's a knowledge graph? Uh, some of you may, of course, know it inside out. Others that don't, uh, let me tell you, you've been using it every day. Okay, and one uh, example is Google. They started using it in 2012. And, you know, data is sort of arranged in the graph in terms of triples here. Barack Obama is married to Michelle Obama. So this is what we call the triple. But you cannot only do this with instance. You could also say a man is married to a woman as a concept, okay? So both the concepts and the instances are represented in these triples. So, and the world avatar is basically an extension of that principle, as it has not only the concepts and instances, but also agents. So these are objects that are able to rearrange the knowledge graph, okay? In a way, it's nothing else but the brain of the world. It can hold concepts, it can learn, it can change their inputs going into it and outputs. There are a set of active processes that basically changes network. So the beauty about this arrangement is it's unambiguous, it's connected, it's scalable, it's accessible. And here comes the best one. It's multi-domain interoperable and it's evolving in time. So at any point in time, it represents the world as it is. Just like you have an idea what the world looks like. If you just close your eyes and think about the world, the same is true for this model. Okay? Of course, just like you, this is not perfect. And it can never be perfect because it would be the world itself. So it's just a specific snapshot of what is important. Okay? So what can it do for you? So in the first instance, it can find answers, right? You can ask questions like, what's the Singapore's marine traffic? And then, you know, there's an output agent and plots all these ship positions, their velocity um, right in front of Singapore. Or you could ask, what's the percentage of fuel poverty as a function of location in the, in the UK? And what you see here is base data that are now fed into that knowledge graph. Okay, and everywhere where it's red, okay, these are areas where people are, uh, struggle to pay their gas bill. Okay, now remember this, we'll come back to this. 
And here, this is a result of COVID because that's my hometown in Pimmelsen in the southwest of Germany, where Germany is most beautiful. We went early at the, at, the, at the border of the ground. And so we started digitalization my home. Then, of course, you cannot only ask uh, what is in the base work, you can also control the base work. So there are output agents that modify actuators and tell uh, the real world what to do. And one example is our CAS laboratory in Singapore. Here you see the green buildings, that's the floor plan, okay? And these are um, sensors, and here you get the live data. So this data, the classical building management system, is then fed into the knowledge graph. And here you see instances, not the conflicts, just the instances. So modeling, we have the agent for the makeup air unit, and that is using real-time ambient humidity, which also comes into the input agent, and temperature to control um, the cooling duty and the required cooling water and circulation rate. But you cannot just control building, you may control the district heating network of a whole town. And this is again, um, Pirmas and my hometown in Germany, uh, where I spent um, the COVID uh, uh, time uh, last year and talked to the utility provider. So here you have a waste from energy plant, uh, a combined heat and power gas turbine, number of boilers, uh, a gas turbine that can sell electricity to the grid and a distribution system and consumers. And with an intelligent agent, you were able to save 20% um, cost. And in this, in, this, in this case, that also means we save CO2 emissions. Right, okay, but the most exciting part of this brain is that it can imagine. It not only has a, a, a live representation of the base world, it also can put a parallel world on top of it. Just as you can imagine that I sit here with a red shirt on and I keep talking, you can create a parallel world on top of the base world. I want to give you two examples. Once you have a parallel world, of course, the reason to do it is to scenario analysis or ask what if questions. And I asked the following question, what if air source heat pumps were introduced in the UK? What would then happen? Okay, and what you see here, now going back to the fuel poverty um, chart, is what would the fuel bills look like if for uh, a full year, um, every household would just use air source heat pumps. And you can see that in the north, the households that suffer of fuel poverty, in this case, where um, the um, gas bills are um, lower than the electricity bills, um, is in the north and um, in London, where it's actually quite warm, and hence the um, fuel pumps, so um, the heat uh, pumps, are, um, are much more efficient, okay, there the bills um, actually go down. Or you could ask classical extreme weather scenario, what if Kings Lynn area in Norfolk gets flooded, okay? So this is the Kings Lynn area. So you could um, look at um, different types of flooding, Okay, so this, uh, the rivers, um, this would be the tides, this is a combination of the two, these are the areas that are sort of in danger, then you could ask yourself, okay, what infrastructure would be taken up? And these are the power um, generation plants in these areas. Um, then um, here there is one gas terminal that may be threatened. Um, then we can look at um, the gas offtakes down here, okay, or at the gas pipelines. Uh, that's what you can see here. But also you can look at the actual crops and you can see what type of plants uh, would be damaged. 
and what a financial impact that would have on, say, the farming and, and agriculture. Marcus, you have one minute. And with that slide, I would like to finish my talk, and I'm at the end. And magically, you have looked at almost 40 slides, which I apologize for. Um, and I'm looking forward to <laughs> attempting uh, answering your question. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Marcus. Brilliant talk. How do you choose? This is a question from Keshav, which came in the chat box. Let How do you choose which aspect my... of the real world model? Sorry, how do you choose which aspects of the real world to model in the avatar? Can there be many avatars for the same physical entity? So how do we choose? Whatever we can get our hands on, we take. Okay. Uh, can there be many avatars for one and the same entity? The answer is yes. Just as you can have many representation of your kitchen table, when you think about it, okay? Um, are they all correct? Is there a one-to-one -one mapping? Never. Um, but there are specific characteristics. We use these concepts to describe these characteristics. Another question. Okay, thank you. Um, there's one from Eric here. The knowledge graph will require access to vast amounts of data to create the parallel world. How do you access and process all of that data? Is it publicly available? Is the data distributed or do you have to bring it together in one place? Um, the whole point is that the data is distributed, um, but this is one of the active research areas. This is indeed a very relevant question and it's far from trivial and we haven't solved it. Um, we have solved it for the use cases we, we've been presenting. Everything of our work um, is in the public domain. If you go to the Puma website, you will see that all the codes are in the GitHub. Um, and in principle, you can download all the data. <clears throat> um, so yes, it is uh, available, but one of the problems we have at the moment it is uh, it's very difficult to use. Okay, it's not, it's not close to a, a point where it can be easily used. But in theory, um, we are willing to collaborate with everyone. Um, whether we have the full resources, that's a different matter. Is the data distributed? Yes, at the moment it is both in Singapore and in Cambridge. Um, and we are now trying out standard cloud access. Speed is very important. Um, so, um, so we use specific Docker environments for agents. Um, that are also distributed and um, use uh, different types of triple stores. Um, the architecture on how to handle the, the, the family of triple stores that should work all together, um, that is still subject to research. It's not perfect, it's just, I made it sound better than the state of the, of the actual affairs is. Yeah? But what I didn't talk about, we also do chemistry with this, and it's also part of the same system. So everything, I've shown it all one in the same system. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Marcus, and thanks again for this excellent talk. Um, we're going to introduce our okay. next. Okay, bye bye. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to introduce our next speaker, who is Srinivasan Geshev from uh, the Department of Computer Science and uh, Technology, and his talk is called Climate, Carbon, and Computer Science. So, Geshev, please do share your slides. Thank you, Dr. And I think uh, my slide should be visible. Um, uh, thanks, Marcus, for your talk. And I think uh, it's a very nice uh, introduction to what I'm going to say as well. So I'll, I'm also going to stay at a fairly high level in this presentation. Um, so we've all heard about the issues of climate change. This audience needs no further uh, introduction to the problems of fires and winds and very high temperatures, 18.3 degrees centigrade in Antarctica, which is to me quite mind boggling to convene. It could be in a shirt sleeves in Antarctica. But um, the reason is, of course, because of the. Sorry, sorry, just one moment. Is it possible to go on slideshow mode? Ah, yes, I can, sure. Uh, it's yeah. Small. Is that better? Um, uh, 
Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. I'll just get yeah, the That's great. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So the, the reason is, of course, because of the of 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 carbon in the atmosphere, which is being shown over here, and we are already close to about four hundred and twenty parts per million. Sorry, I don't know why this. Oh, okay. And uh, I can't seem to get to the next slide. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, we already had about 420 parts per million. Uh, and with the emission scenario, it seems to be getting even higher. So the obvious question to ask is where is all this carbon coming from? And the IPCC in its report in 2014, which is the latest available, talked about this and different sources of carbon. So I'm just going to walk you through the slide because there's quite a bit of material over here. So on the left-hand side, we have direct emissions of carbon. And on the right hand side, indirect emissions of carbon, which I all come essentially from electricity. So if you look at it, the biggest bucket, the biggest uh, cost is coming from industry, which is about 32%, which is both from direct and indirect. And primarily this is coming from um, industries like, industries like uh, steel and cement. The next big bucket is electricity and heat production, which is 25%. And of course, that uh, it gets used for other purposes. Uh, and after that, we're down into uh, buildings, which take about 18%, which is primarily for heating and cooling. Of course, there's some use for uh, IT inside buildings and so on, but it's mostly heating and cooling. And then transportation is about 14%. Um, so if we take all of these into account, uh, these are the sources of carbon. And interestingly enough, um, for some reason, I'm not able to advance my slides. Okay. For some reason, uh, what people think about as IT or technology having a large carbon footprint is actually not that much. If you take a uh, look at the newspaper headlines, people talk about data centers consuming too much power, uh, you know, Netflix consuming a lot of substantially to global warming. It's actually not very, it's not true. So if you, the, there was an analyst fairly recently in this paper that was cited at the bottom. And at least until 2015, data centers or, and all data transmission, all mobile devices, all consume uh, just 1% of the carbon budget. So non-ICT is 99%. So IT by itself is not a big factor. And I should say this except for Bitcoin which is a pig. And in my opinion, Bit Bitcoin should be banned. Just like the, the world got together to ban uh, <laughs> in the Montreal Protocol, chlorofluorocarbons, they should also ban Bitcoin in the same way because it's uh, causing as much damage as the CFCs because Bitcoin is also at one to one and a half percent. So Bitcoin alone is as much as all the rest of IT put together, which is absolutely tragic. Um, the reason uh, why, uh, other than Bitcoin, things are pretty good is because the efficiency of data centers has gone way up. If you look at the x-axis, this is from 2010 to 2019, the gray line at the bottom is data center energy use, which is actually flat, practically flat, whereas the internet traffic and data center workloads have go both gone up a factor of about 10. So in fact, data, uh, data center efficiency has increased by a factor of 10 on a per by the per bit per second basis, which is really quite impressive. Okay, in fact, digital technology is probably the world's most powerful influencer to accelerate action to stabilize global temperatures below two degrees centigrade, according to the World Economic Forum, and another organization called the Exponential Roadmap, which we'll talk about more in just a moment, has said that the, uh, the IT, the digital sector, has the potential to directly reduce fossil fuel emissions by fifteen percent by twenty thirty and indirectly support a further reduction of 35%. So why is that? I mean, what's, what's the magic? What's going on? So to understand that, it's best to look at the exponential roadmap, which is this uh, really nice piece of work that came out last year from Sweden. And it talks about the 36 solutions to halving emissions by 2030, it's at the bottom of the screen. And uh, I won't go through all the uh, different approaches, but the carbon emissions are coming from those big buckets that I talked about. And what this roadmap does is to essentially talk about each of those buckets. And on the left-hand side, if you see it, you'll see energy, industry, buildings, transport, uh, nature-based, so that's AF, oil, your agriculture, forestry, other land use, and so on. And then the nature-based things. So all the items on the left correspond quite clearly 
to the ones that the IPCC talks about. And what's fascinating is that IT can be used for each of those left-hand side items. Every single of these 36 items comes, comes down to uh, using IT properly, exactly as, as Marcus already uh, mentioned. Um, and so I want to talk broadly about the role of computer science and then give some examples in the remaining time. The first, uh, I want to go through what are the things that we do, what IT can do broadly uh, that couldn't do even 20 years ago, or certainly not 50 years ago or, or 30 years ago when the Kyoto Protocol was developed. One is data gathering through sensing and communication. And so this is basically the ability for us to build very cheap sensors and for them to communicate with each other and gather the data exactly to build the kind of digital twins that we've already been talked to. Uh, talk to. The, the second step is, uh, okay, is data analysis. Once we have the data, we don't want to just keep it there. We want to do something with it, is to build models, to use machine learning or statistical analysis to learn more about what's going on in the real world. Once you've done that, you can actually optimize things. You can figure out how best to do things. And again, optimization typically involves building a model and then doing some kind of what if analysis uh, or other, I should say, choosing the right parameters to minimize certain objective functions. We can also do what if analysis. We can do simulations where we can represent uh, certain agents and can forecast what would happen if a certain if a certain thing was done. So it allows us to do in the in the digital world or the avatar world, if you will, uh, something that you couldn't try out in terms of experiments in the real world. You also control things. You can actuate things using embedded systems or robotics. And finally, you can provide trust in what you're doing by using distributed ledgers. Now, these things should look familiar because Marcus's talk really talked about all of these things as well uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a, using a slightly different metaphor. But nevertheless, it all comes down to a gathering, analysis, optimization, control, and of course, providing trust. So uh, what I'm going to do next is to walk through some examples of how we can use these technologies, uh, these, these uh, approaches in, in solving real world problems. But we have to keep in mind that in addition to having computer science as a, with all these technologies available to us, we also have other non-computer science technologies which are also revolutionary. Uh, these include uh, solar photovoltaic, which has, dropped, uh, which has dropped in price dramatically. Uh, from about $70 a watt about 50 years ago to about 30 cents a watt now. So it's a huge decline and a similar decline in the cost of storage, which is due to the rise of electric vehicles. So, and of course we have uh, distributed uh, ledgers of blockchain, IoT and satellites, which, uh, which offer us um, the ability to look at the uh, world from space in unprecedented detail. In short, we are we are we have a number of really exciting technologies available to us to to combat this uh, uh, the climate change. So what what is really exciting is to combine these non CS technologies with computer science in order to do some uh, in order to have real uh, real benefits. So uh, let me do a couple of examples over here. So here is an example in the smart grid. So the picture in the back shows what's called a pickup plant. This is an electrical generation plant that's brought online only to supply the peak load. Uh, this is in Massachusetts and it supplies peak load for about 40 hours a year. And you can imagine the embedded energy in building such a plant and maintaining it and so on and all the carbon costs of running it. Um, and it's only because of 40 hours of the year you have a very high load typically due to air conditioning being turned on. If you could use computer communication and appropriate incentives to ask people to either pre-cool their homes, it means turn on the air conditioning early in the morning rather than middle of the afternoon, or alternatively reduce high loads during those peak hours, you don't need those peak plants anymore. So sensing communication control along with incentives can actually reduce uh, the need for these kinds of plants and save a lot of carbon. Similarly, you could schedule refrigerators. So this is a specific project I'm referring to that's being done in Germany, where there isn't much transmission capacity between the North and the South. North has wind power, the South has, has industry. But if you could schedule refrigerators to pre-cool food um, and then turn them off, 
uh, your food doesn't spoil for about three or four hours. And during that time, you don't need the transmission from the north. You can use that for something else. So again, you see how you're sensing communication control actuation, which come together to reduce energy costs. And in this case, reduce the need for actually building transmission lines. Uh, similarly, you could have electric vehicles charge whenever there's a, a, a excess wind energy, rather than curtailing wind as it's being done today, they can actually use that wind to charge electric cars faster when there's excess wind energy. Again, none of these things would be possible if you didn't have sensing communication control. So I'm not gonna repeat that over and over again because that is the theme of what I'm gonna talk about over here. But in fact, you can have practical examples of how this is happening in the world today already. What about building energy use? Um, many buildings look like what I've shown in the picture in the back. It's an empty office, with all the lights on, okay? And probably heated or cooled to 23 degrees centigrade whether it's with minus 20 outside or plus 40 outside. So uh, if there's nobody in the building, there's no need to heat or cool it or return the lights on. And obviously we can, we can control that using occupancy-based heating and cooling, again, sensing control and daylight harvesting. We can reduce the amount of lighting. If there's sunny outside, you get enough lights coming. In transportation, one of the biggest revolutions is going to, we are going to see in our own lifetime is usership, not ownership. You don't need to own a car if you have Uber, where you're using the service. And the same thing could be true, will be true for uh, car ownership in general. Uh, the number of the people, the young people in the audience may never own the car in their lifetime, and they probably never need to, because they can have either uh, drivers or autonomous vehicles where they use the services rather than actually owning a car, which is sitting idle 97% of the time, actually. Um, obviously, we can do things better by optimizing uh, tra traffic signals or even trucking, uh, something people don't think about much is how to schedule how fast trucks drive so that when they approach a city, they're not going to be stuck in traffic signals or stuck in uh, traffic jams. They can reroute themselves and they can actually uh, be intelligent of how to use the road. And there's work being done uh, by researchers exactly on that. And if you do things properly, you can actually reduce the need for more roads and physical infrastructure. Instead of spending whatever it is, 30 billion pounds on new roads, that money might be better spent on optimizing the existing roads so that you don't need that many roads in the first place. Um, we've all been working <laughs> remotely for the last year and a half. Uh, that is cut down on transport. Actually, you don't need to move bodies if you can move bits, which is exactly what we're doing right now. If all of us were in a seminar room right now, we probably have a pretty high carbon footprint rather than just listening to it on Zoom. Uh, and the paperless office, which used to be a joke, uh, has actually become real. I don't recall the last time I printed a paper out to read. Uh, it was fascinating that in the COP26, you saw the entire plenary session. There were hundreds and hundreds of people with not one sheet of paper. Every single person had either a laptop or a mobile that they were reading out their texts from. There's no paper. It's, and if you can imagine 30 years ago, if you had an international conference, there'd probably be 100 tons of paper that came with it. One of the more interesting and important things is behavioral change. Can we actually change the way people behave in, in for example, electric adopting electric cars or in their food choices because they're part of social networks and they care about how other people think. So uh, for all the negative press about Facebook and Twitter, uh, we, you know, it's also true that they are agents of behavioral change and exploited properly. Or you know, if there's a road in the, I'm showing the road in the forest, you, know, you take the left or the right fork. What we'd like to do is to get people to use these social networks or be influenced by social networks in the right way, rather than you know, deciding to, to, to not get vaccinated or something equally silly. Uh, finally, we would like to look at transparency. We want to get people to believe in what's being told to them. And transparency comes through uh, having access to primary data. If somebody says the world is warming up, if you really care about it, you can dig right in because if you have open data and you have stuff in a block, if you have that stored in a blockchain, you can access it. Um, the second one is blockchain based tokenization of positive externalities. It's quite a mouthful. Um, and the easiest way to think about it is if you plant a tree and you're absorbing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere into your tree, it would be nice if you got paid for it. And we can arrange for that to happen. That's in one sentence, what we're trying to do through the Cambridge Center for Carbon Credit, which I'm associated with. And you can also use this in a broader scale for monitoring of nature-based solutions. So to sum up, I think that the next three decades, we will need to see radical transformations in multiple sectors of society. 
And I think it's fair to say that computer science has a critical role to play. If you're interested, you'd like to learn more, I would encourage you to look, go to this website for the ACM, the Special Interest Group on Energy, which is energy.acm.org, where uh, there's quite a bit more on many of the things I've talked about in this brief presentation. And I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keshav. That was a really positive talk. I really love all of those practical examples of computer science and scheduling that, are, you know, that you described that are actually in use today. Um, looking at the chat, we've got a question from Jennifer. Um, Jennifer says, you focus on ICT's carbon impact as a result of energy consumption. Have you looked at the total footprint of IT, taking into account mining, match, manufacturing use and disposal? It would be interesting to know if there are figures for this, given the carbon impact of industry. Um, I, I don't know if you might want to jump in, Jennifer, but are you talking about like the CMOS silicon chip processing and the communications infrastructure, all of like everything? Yeah, so it's looking at IT as having an environmental impact that goes beyond running devices to actually making them. Um, and I think, you know, this is something that a lot of people are looking at in relation to now rare earth minerals, uh, mining for lithium, shortage of copper and all the rest of it. And mining, of course, is a major uh, contributor to carbon emissions and so on. You mentioned steel and concrete, but uh, generally within that industry figure, it'd be kind of interesting to see that unpacked and to know to what extent within those different sectors the manufacturing of ICT as, as an industry is um, also contributing to carbon emissions and not just focusing on the, uh, the use of it during its active lifetime and so on. I think that's an excellent observation. And uh, at the moment, I, I'm not aware personally of anybody who's done that kind of life cycle, life cycle analysis for IT as a whole. It's typically focused on the operation rather than the embodied energy, which is, of course, another lens of looking at it. So. Uh, I think if somebody in the audience wants to do a good PhD, this would be a great place to go. So thank, thank you. Um, can I just jump in with a very quick question? Um, so is this going to be more easy to, to take up in the global south? Because then they don't have the same, they, they don't have as many cars, they don't have a straight stable grid system necessarily, they have probably more mini grids, they don't have to focus on you know, they don't have as much focus on materialization. I mean, are, are these are these good case studies that in global south that could be used? Yeah, indeed. I mean, I think that's a, that's a, that's a very good observation. I mean, uh, I can point to many examples, but uh, you know, for example, the world's largest copper mine is not in you know, it's not in wherever the country it is. The world's largest copper mine is the copper buried under the streets of the United States, right? With all the telephone wires which aren't, aren't being used anymore. So in, in, in the, the Global South has skipped all of that stage and gone straight to mobile phones. In the same way, uh, uh, you know, you heard about India's pledge to have 50% of its energy come from renewables in 2030. They're skipping the entire stage of building, you know, more coal plants, uh, thank goodness. Uh, so these kinds of microgrids based on solar and storage are becoming increasingly feasible rather than building centralized uh, uh, coal plant or for that matter, nuclear power plants in many countries. So leapfrogging, as they call this, is, uh, is a very interesting, uh, I think very important uh, direction to take. And uh, obviously it works best when you don't have legacy infrastructure and more importantly, legacy players who have got legislative capture. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, there are quite a few more questions in the chat. I hope you don't mind going in there and giving some uh, written answers, if that's sure. okay. No, I'd be happy to, yeah. Thank you very much, Kesha, for this fantastic talk. And Thank you. Uh, our next keynote speaker is Jennifer Gabris. Jennifer is Chair in Media, Culture and Environment at the Department of Sociology. And her talk is entitled AI for Earth, Investigating the Social Consequences of Environmental Technologies. So Jennifer, go for it. Just jump out of that and jump into that. There we go. Can you see and hear everything? Looks good. Okay, great. So um, slight change in approach, but I think still very much resonant with um, the first two talks um, is looking, especially at the social consequences of AI and environment, 
um, and doing this through a new project, relatively new project that I'm leading, uh, funded by the ERC, and this is in the Department of Sociology. So I want to kind of unpick what some of the social political consequences of these AI environment and more broadly environmental, uh, digital environmental technologies might be. So just very briefly, Smart Forests um, is a project that looks at these technologies and, and asks questions about equity, plurality, and livability. Uh, we focus on forests, of course, because they are now key ecosystems within attempts to address climate change and environmental change and are also sites of increasing digital governance. I'm sure you're uh, familiar with no shortage of technologies now that are mapping and monitoring forests and also attempting to preserve them in different ways. So we look at this phenomena and also ask to what extent these technologies have um, environmental impacts of their own, but the key focus is on the social political impacts of, of these systems. So we ask how smart forests are shaping environmental governance, citizen engagement and social political strategies for addressing environmental change. And um, we look at how they might constrain and enable approaches to environmental change um, and how forests themselves are becoming technologies, not least of which through offsetting carbon. So I'm just going to walk through what are the kind of key digital operations um, that we investigate uh, to give an example of some of the ways that I'm referring to these social political consequences of digital technologies um, for managing um, environments. So the first is observation. So um, as we've, we've heard already, um, there are a lot of environmental technologies that are now being used to observe environments and environmental systems, to monitor and manage them, um, to describe their operations um, and to try to make them more efficient. Um, here we look at how this observation constitutes a form of governance, um, that it can enable uh, certain kinds of approaches that might be efficient, but it also could enable different kinds of extraction um, and through supply chain monitoring could create different kinds of economic political arrangements um, that really favor people who are um, computationally sort of engaged. So what does that mean, for instance, for people living in forests in, in the global south, um, if they are now required to engage with digital technologies as part of their practices? Um, what are the ways in which those uh, relationships are being understood and set up so that people are not excluded from these systems and have a voice um, in contributing to forest management. We could also then say that uh, observation technologies are typically capturing forests in specific ways, often as resources, as um, carbon stores, uh, as uh, timbers, sites of standing timber um, and other commodities. Um, but they're not necessarily thinking of these environments as cosmologies or um, as the kinds of experiences and lived realities that many people engaged in um, forest spaces uh, for their livelihoods might be engaged, what might be uh, in living in these environments. So this is a kind of question about whether observation technologies could potentially shift and expand in different ways to not primarily or only be describing forests as resources, but also to take into account these uh, more pluralistic ways of thinking about forests. So, I mean, we could say that, you know, this is often a project geared toward extraction, it's often to make that extraction more sustainable, but that might also not be the way that a lot of forest dwellers want to think about the use of technology, and they might have other ideas for what it means to observe forests. Um, so this is something that we really want to, um, that we're engaging with as part of the observation uh, component of this project, looking at everything from remote sensing and LIDAR to um, IoT. So inevitably these digital operations are connected um, and we are looking then in the second instance at how many of these um, devices are not just observing and describing, but they're also attempting to automate and optimize as we've heard um, already. So this is a question about what is then um, an ideal sort of 
scenario to work towards um, and how is this more or less sort of implemented within digital systems to um, address environmental change um, and to work toward uh, what are defined as more sustainable conditions. So um, inevitably, you know, carbon stores, uh, forests as carbon stock are uh, a key example here. I mentioned wildfires in the last slide, but there are many forms of environmental change and environmental preservation that digital technologies are monitoring and managing to work towards. Um, how are there particular social values that are uh, distinctly sort of embedded within the understanding of what forests are and what they ought to be? Um, whose values are those? Um, and how can this be a process of thinking about not only what the technology can do best according to kind of its self-evident logics, but how it might expand to um, consider, address, and engage with other uh, ways of living in forests and taking forests into account. So we could say that automation and optimization practices can converge or diverge from these diverse and situated forest practices and values. And this is exactly what we're looking at, um, in which ways are, um, for instance, indigenous communities using these technologies to um, help them manage forest environments and even be taken seriously within spaces of scientific evidence. But how are these also presenting challenges for them in what they would um, hope to represent and activate in their forest experiences? So we could say that decisions about what to automate and optimize are never depoliticized. And these operations can have specific consequences for forest livelihoods. So moving on to the third operation uh, that we look at in this project, um, we're looking at how forests are inevitably turned into data as part of this. And this is a project of in intensive data production, as we've heard um, from everything from digital twinning um, uh, to different forms of sensor networks and earth observation. Um, and digital twinning is, for instance, being used to uh, project different forest scenarios, different um, biodiversity and green scenarios. So how does data really become central to environmental decision making and who has the capability of generating that data? Is that governments or is that particular technology companies? Is that environmental NGOs? And how do these practices of datafication then change the ways in which environmental governance unfolds? We could say that what um, is decided to measure and monitor in forests is a particular way of making forests matter um, and that certain kinds of variables might be decided as important because they express carbon stores and others are considered less relevant because they might speak to um, things that are not sort of active considerations within particular kinds of environmental governance. So we, we're looking at this and thinking about um, what it means to rely so heavily on data for making so many of these environmental governance decisions. We could say that then um, within this operation of datafication, forests are often sites of expert monitoring, um, but many uh, forest dwellers have diverse knowledge about these environments, whether their data is taken into account is um, uh, really variable across the board. Uh, and we can say that um, uh, really, that different kinds of forest data are more easily rendered into data sets. Um, but there might be all kinds of observations and, and forms of taking account of data uh, of forests that are not easily rendered into data, but they're still, they still count as um, important insights for how um, forests are kind of uh, creating different kinds of livelihoods. So we could ask then um, whose data counts in this datafication of forests. Um, you know, here's an example from the James Reserve, some very early field work um, I did uh, more than a decade ago, looking at how uh, observations about phenology and climate change were developed through the sensor network um, here with um, bird boxes with webcams to look at when um, birds were laying their eggs and hatching out and how this could express uh, changes um, in the climate, in, in temperature, and how this might more broadly be connected to changes in phenology. 
Of course, um, there might be related comparable observations about changings of uh, seasonal timings that are not so easily datified, but could actually make just as important contributions to understanding environmental change. So this then really leads to the question of participation. Um, we could say that digital technologies are changing forest engagements and participation in part because there are now so many platforms for um, organizing participation in forests, uh, including um, everything from restoring forests, different kinds of scenarios to um, mapping and tracking deforestation and act, asking citizens to become involved in that um, set of activities. Here you can also see an example of where um, indigenous uh, Amazonian tribes are using drones to map um, deforestation and to use this data to attempt to halt deforestation. So we could say that these participatory technologies make for us sensible and actionable and in distinct ways um, and often require certain kinds of actions. Here, um, Indigenous forest dwellers in some ways uh, have to take up monitoring and enforcement actions in order to address the problem of deforestation. So what does that mean to ask them to monitor forests in these ways and potentially get caught up in um, scenarios where they're having to confront people engaged in illegal deforestation activities, for instance? So we could say also then that digital technologies are enabling uh, distinct kinds of civic contributions, but they're also potentially foreclosing others. And we want to think carefully about what those might be. Um, for instance, what does it mean for platforms to be a kind of primary space in which people are understanding and observing forests, um, potentially then having more remote engagements with many forest problems. And in fact, much of the kind of deforestation the deforestation tracking is um, through people engaged in remote settings. So this finally then leads to questions of regulation and transformation, which in a way is really running through all of these digital operations and the ways that we're studying um, forests and AI technologies are a key way in which um, this is taking place. But how are forests transformed through digital technologies? Um, here you can see an example of a drone project, Drone Seed, which attempts to engage in restoration at scale of forests by uh, mass planting. Um, of course, this has been critiqued in various ways um, for uh, how it might be uh, less engaged with problems of biodiversity and so on. But we could say that this is a kind of computationally framed problem because it imagines restoration as a problem of scale, speed, efficiency, and optimization. Um, and this is then in turn transforming environments and governance. And how might that then present problems for people on the ground who might be interested in agroecological solutions, uh, a more kind of measured approach to restoration um, and so on. So we could ask inevitably, what are the limitations um, as well as potential of these different interactions and how can we really keep those at the forefront so that the technology doesn't end up um, basically driving and determining many of the environmental solutions and so that a real plurality of people engaged in democratic decision making are um, involved in these projects. So if you're interested more broadly in um, this topic, I've written a, a short kind of commentary in Big Data and Society. It's probably the best overview of the topic. Um, it builds on earlier work of mine on environmental sensing. And of course, we're uh, trying to update our website at smartforest.net on a regular basis. So um, have a look there for new stuff we're developing. Thank you, Jennifer. That was a brilliant talk. Another really positive <laughs> talk where it seems like fantastic work is being done. Uh, please do put your que uh, questions to Jennifer into the chat. Um, I've got uh, one. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Red Plus practices. Uh, do you think that the are these linked up? And do you think that this is a, a good kind of uh, mechanism by which you can collect useful data, but also the other way around? Does that empower the people who are trying to fight deforestation? Yes, in fact, this is something that we've written about um, in a paper that's currently under review. But we do look at how um, many Red Plus uh, systems, of course, require different kinds of data gathering and data reporting. Um, 
which can be used in certain ways to protect forests, but many people within a kind of uh, sociological, political ecology space also ask really key questions about how forest dwellers are then required to become data gatherers and have to comply with many of these Red Plus reporting obligations, which could actually um, put them at odds with how they are living in forest environments and the different practices that they're engaged in. So without kind of saying more about that, um, because the paper's under review, but um, this is, I think, a key consideration is how do these governance mechanisms really require digital technologies, digital practices, digital infrastructures to um, be operationalized? And what then are the social political consequences of that? And how can we kind of think quite carefully about that? And also perhaps build in mechanisms for um, iteration and uh, revision where things might not be working as well as they could. And also think about where the sites of digital technology development are taking place so that there can be more equitable approaches to um, forest management if engaged with digital technologies. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, I've got, uh, oh, we've got a question from Eric. When working from indigenous with indigenous forest dwelling communities using these forest sensing technologies, what was your experience of them confronting deforestation activities with their observations? Did, how did those interactions go and did they meet with pushback? So we are at the early stages of doing a survey of existing um, projects and technologies. So the example I showed um, was from a pre-existing project um, and that was not our own. Hopefully you could see the, the image credit. Um, that was not our own uh, project. But I think this is something that we have been learning about through the broader survey of, of what's going on. Um, you know, it's, it's a tricky situation for um, Indigenous people to be uh, put in situations of having to be on the front lines, really, of um, mapping, monitoring, and potentially acting on deforestation activities. And there are many, many technologies in this space that are now proliferating. Um, Global Forest Watch and its platform has a series of alerts built in, as well as an app um, for uh, receiving alerts and going out in the field and taking note of uh, deforestation events when they occur and reporting those. So I think there can't be a kind of um, universal assessment of uh, whether these are good or bad necessarily. It really depends on the situations that people are in, the reporting context, the ways that data are turned into action, and whether governments at local and or regional national levels take that data seriously. So in some of our interviews, we found that this can be quite effective um, where people are often kind of resisting getting into confrontations with active deforestation events, but they do document them and report them to um, different sites of governance and environmental NGOs and those can be acted on. But then on the other hand, it can put people at risk um, and uh, as you might know, environmental defenders are um, some of the most um, uh, sort of murdered people in the world in terms of activist groups. So it's, it's not the sort of thing that I would just um, sort of advocate universally. I would say it really depends on what the networks um, and relations are in those contexts. And I think this is also then perhaps a challenge to computation in a way to think about how it might be situated and responsive to the environments that it's working in um, and be kind of flexible and adaptable enough to be able to work with those, those contacts. Okay, thank, thanks, Eric. That was really a great question. Um, I've got one final very quick question from me. Um, uh, so can this be adaptable to other systems? Because I can really imagine environmental sensing practices happening for, say, mountain ecosystems or uh, ocean environments. And, uh, you know, is, is this like a really good sort of template for promoting democratic decision making for all of these different environments? If, you know, th those are our goals for net zero is reforestation and protecting biodiversity and, you know, ecological habitats. Do you think that this is this can is I guess it can't be just picked up and stamped? elsewhere, but is this the beginning of, you know, a, a, like protocols and methods for doing this? Yes, I would hope so. I mean, I think that's a really generous question because, you know, it suggests that there's a, a kind of um, 
broader relevance for the questions that uh, we're asking for many types of land uses, many habitats, and um, for really thinking proactively about the changes that are going to be needed in environmental governance, the tools and infrastructures that will be used and developed, and how to ensure that those are democratic um, and are leading to more just engagements. So um, yes, I would hope so very much that this can be a broader conversation about uh, across multiple land uses. Okay, brilliant. Um, there is a fantastic question I, I didn't see from Megan in the chat. So if you don't mind popping in there and, uh, and, and answering that, that would be really great. So thank you very much, Jennifer. And, thank you. Uh, Thank you very much to Keshav and Marcus as well, so our three keynote speakers for today. And we can move on to our um, early career presentations. Our first speaker from this, this part of the session is Yenfang Su. Uh, Yenfang is currently at Purdue, but um, he's, when he's finished his PhD, he's going to be starting really soon in Cambridge, in a couple of weeks, I think, in Abir al Tabas group. So his title, uh, talk is entitled AI Enab Enabled Sensing Technology for sustainable infrastructure. So Yen Feng, please do uh, put your slide um, slideshow up. Sure, sure thank you. Uh, okay, can you see my screen now? Looks great. Okay, yeah, so uh, hello everyone. My name is Yen Feng Su and uh, I'm an upcoming postdoctoral of research at Professor Otabas Group and uh, I will join uh, Cambridge pretty soon next month. So uh, I want to share uh, my work, part of my work uh, entitled AI Enable Sensing Technology for Sustainable uh, Civil Infrastructures. So uh, as we all know that uh, construction is responsible for approximately 11% of annual global CO2 emissions. So specifically, uh, including uh, cement manufacturing and uh, uh, transportation of the concrete or uh, during the construction operation or even traffic delay owing to the uh, construction. So in this field decay, the researcher proposed some solution use uh, advanced material or emergent sensing technology and try to solve this problem. So uh, for the advanced material, uh, some researchers propose to use uh, self-healing material alternatives, a cement or a low carbon material to uh, replace the conventional construction material. And uh, also using the emergent sensing technology, we will be able to gather some real time uh, measurement of the infrastructure performance and reduce the maintenance costs by finding some structure damage or premature failure before the condition becomes worse. So uh, specifically for civil infrastructure such as bridge, it would age and deteriorate uh, due to the degradation of the materials. So without proper maintenance, uh, so we might need to rebuild or reconstruct the, uh, the bridge for the uh, to meet the public need. And it's not only costly, but it's not uh, friendly to our environment. So uh, uh, one of the best solution to reduce the greenhouse emission from the construction is to repair or retrofit the uh, current infrastructure. So it would not only extend the surface life of the uh, civil infrastructure, but also reduce 15% uh, to 25% of uh, CO2 emission compared with the new construction. So the key to repair the uh, civil infrastructure is the uh, reliable sensing technology that will be able to inform us when and where need to be repaired before we have any safety concern of the infrastructures. So uh, currently there are many uh, sensing technology can be used to assess the condition of different parts of civil infrastructures. And uh, the, this technology coupled with the artificial intelligence or the, some algorithm could would significantly improve the accuracy and also forecast the future condition of the uh, civil infrastructure. So among this sensing technology, I wanna introduce uh, part of my work is using the EMI sensing technology, which attract many attention this year due to the low cost and the ability to perform both early edge sensing during the construction and the long-term structure health monitoring. So uh, the full name of this EMI method uh, of my study is called uh, piezoelectric sensor-based electromechanical impedance method. So basically this 
uh, EMI method uh, consists of the impedance analyzer and uh, the sensor. So the sensor will bond with the whole structure and then trigger use the alternative current, which make the sensor vibrate. And then due to the piezoelectric effect, it can receive the feedback signal from the condition of whole structure. So uh, we can use this technology to estimate the concrete quality to avoid the premature failure and improve the efficiency of the construction operation in answer safety, also uh, for the long-term uh, performance monitoring. So uh, this slide shows the uh, simulation of this uh, EMI sensing technology and the underlying mechanism. So, uh, so imagine we have the uh, concrete material at a very early age and uh, so that uh, uh, the stiffness of this con concrete material is low and uh, as uh, time pass, so we got the hardened concrete with a high, higher stiffness. So the, the sensor we develop bound with the whole structure and the sensor will vibrate together with the whole structure. Then whole structure with different stiffness will restrict the vibration in different way and the result in different uh, spectroscopy. So, so that we can take advantage of this uh, spectroscopy and to convert that into the index. So, and then we can monitor the uh, condition of the structure. So uh, we conduct a comprehensive experiment to verify this uh, feasibility of this method. So we convert the uh, spectroscopy and they use uh, one of the statistic method called the room mean square deviation method to deconvolute the, the, the spectroscopy to turn that into the uh, index. And then we compare our index with the mechanical property and we see very high alignment. And also we try different type of uh, cementition material in our lab with different mixture design, different recipe. So uh, our result indicate that all the mixture, uh, all the uh, different material shows x and r square, which are all above the point day day. And furthermore, I employ the data-driven approach to build a predictive model. So, so uh, we start from the data collection and to define the descriptor of uh, the data we obtained from experiment works and then conduct the feature engineering to select or to reduce the dimension of the data. And so the most important thing is uh, to uh, to choose the uh, right uh, algorithms to build your model. And uh, once we get the model trend and, uh, and uh, test, we can adopt the model for predicting and or the sensing performance. So uh, in this study, uh, I collect the data set from the real world large uh, concrete slab uh, so, which is eight feet by twelve feet, and uh, we I conduct six uh, different type of uh, large slab with different mixture design, and we collect the data from the uh, our EMI sensing and the different uh, mechanical property, and uh, the duration of this uh, test is from very early age from six hour to uh, one year. So uh, then I propose to use uh, some uh, the, the machine learning framework, use the generative adversarial network again to overcome the real data usage restriction, which means since uh, uh, we all know that it's very uh, difficult and very costly to uh, obtain the experimental data. So I use the emergent GAN algorithm and to try to expand the data set to simulate the not yet encountered condition. And also, so, so basically we have a real data we uh, obtain from the large slab and then I spill it into 70% for the data synthesized and 30% for uh, real data for uh, testing and uh, go through the uh, data generative model and we got the synthetic data to train our neural network model and then can use the real data to test. So uh, the generative model I use is called a conditional uh, tabular generative model. And they use the more, more specific normalization to overcome the non-Gaussian and multi model di distribution and it is specifically suitable for uh, the data type for our experiment. So I am not going to dig into the detail for this 
algorithm. So if you find interesting, you can refer this paper. And uh, here is the performance of uh, this uh, CT game uh, model I built, a uh, wonderful model I built. So uh, I conduct the cross band validation for this model with different data set. And uh, as you can see here is the uh, uh, data synthetic performance, which case results around 0 0.96, 0 0.98. And then I perform the, uh, uh, I conduct the uh, testing for the, this model and we can get uh, R square of 0 0.8 to 0 0.95. So uh, the, uh, most importantly, compared with other game-based uh, generative model, this CT game model is faster. So uh, this slide uh, provide a com comparison between the conventional method, which is the ACM method and the CEP FIP met method for the concrete strength prediction and the, the model machine learning model we build. So uh, the purple bar is the uh, destructive testing result, which is a ground truth. So as you can see here, so the average error for this conventional model is around 10%. Uh, however, for uh, the model we build, the error can reduce to around five to 6%. So uh, to prove this uh, fe feasibility of this uh, field implementation, we also coordinate with the uh, field engineer and the contractor to conduct the uh, me measurement on the highway construction project, specifically for the concrete foot deep paving project and the uh, concrete patching project. So uh, this slide shows the Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, so this slide shows the result. And uh, I think uh, the green bar is EMI method and uh, the uh, orange bar is uh, a compressive test result. So it's very close to each other to prove this. The, the method is pretty promising. So yeah, uh, in summary, uh, uh, this research developed this AI assist instantaneous um, monitor method, we call the EMI method, and the build a, a machine learning model according uh, to, to uh, pre predict the strength of concrete. And we also conduct the field implementation. So uh, in conclusion, this AI-enabled emergency technology will provide the in-situ condition of the uh, civil infrastructure and achieve the sustainable infrastructure. So yeah, I would like to thank my colleague and funding agency. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. That was a great talk. We've got a question from Eric in the chat. Have you quantified the reduction in carbon emissions that can be achieved through this method? Uh, uh, to be honest, no, we did not quantify that, but we do estimate that. But I think it's relatively hard to quantify for the construction project. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Eric. Um, I've got a quick question from me. How adaptable yep. is the prediction of the sensing as the structure or the geometry of the of the concrete changes? Because you already have a pretty big slab, like 12 foot concrete slab. Can, the, yeah. can the slabs get any bigger with future technology? And what happens when you start 3D printing or you have new building methods? Uh, so uh, basically uh, the mechanism of this uh, sensing technology can can be used for different shape of the sample. And uh, since the uh, sensing zone is limited, so uh, we can adapt to any type of building. And also this can be used for the uh, steel or other type of materials. Okay, so it's like future-proofed. <laughs> okay, that's yeah. great. Okay, if you have any more questions for Yen Feng, please just put them into the chat and then he can give written answers. Uh, in the meantime, thank you very much for that fantastic talk. In the, yeah, uh, we thank can, you. We'll move on to Scott Jean, who is our second speaker um, from our early career researchers. Scott is part of Jonathan Cullen's group um, at the Department of Engineering, and his research focuses on reinforcement learning. And his talk title is Reinforcement Learning for Energy Efficient Control. So Scott, uh, go for it. Hey. Hey, you, you can hear me and you can see my screen and everything? Yeah, looks great. Sounds great. Cool, oh, great. Um, okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Scott Jean. I'm a second year PhD student in the engineering department. Um, great to be here. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk. 
Um, as as just been mentioned, I work with John Cullen and also with Keshav. Um, so you consider you can you can think of this um, presentation as a sort of special case of uh, Keshav's more general presentation earlier on. So I'm going to talk about reinforcement learning for energy efficient control, and I'll start with um, motivating the problem and discussing why I think this is a useful thing to work on. Um, so here's a diagram my supervisor John produced about ten years ago, mapping um, on the left hand side of the screen global primary energy resources to final services on the right hand side of the screen. Um, and although it looks a bit complicated, I just want you to focus on the middle part of the diagram here, where in red we have um, global energy used for heating and cooling, in blue for motion, so transport and driven systems and manufacturing, and in black, everything else. And what we can take from this diagram is that we use roughly 50% of all energy globally to heat and cool spaces, both buildings but also in manufacturing. So if we can come up with ways of um, heating and cooling society more efficiently, and using less energy, this would be uh, an effective climate change mitigation tool. Um, I also want to highlight this little little blue sliver in the bottom left of the diagram, titled Renewable Energy. Um, this uh, diagram is, um, uses data from 2005, so it looks like a small proportion of global primary energy resource, but we think by 2050, renewable energy will contribute to 75% of global primary energy, and this has its own associated problems that Kesha have actually mentioned earlier on. So here to illustrate that, um, let's consider a hypothetical example where we're trying to power your, um, your home, your apartment using a solar array on the roof. And here I'm plotting um, power generated by the solar panel in orange throughout one day. <clears throat> you see it rises during the day as the sun, as the sun rises, peaks um, you know, uh, at lunchtime and then falls in the evening. In contrast, your demand for energy is not quite so symmetric. You kind of have a spike in the morning when you get up, it probably plateaus during the day when you go out to work, and then you get another spike in the evening um, when you come home. And, and this creates periods in the day where there's a mismatch in um, energy supplied renewably and your demand for energy, um, where we have surpluses and deficits. And again, as Kesha mentioned, um, uh, we, we, we have issues when we have a deficit of renewable energy, um, highlighted by this sort of red um, patch in the diagram. And then um, what happens is, uh, in the UK at least, the national grid will spin up gas-powered power plants to provide um, the, uh, the deficit. Um, and this creates um, unnecessary emissions that could have been avoided if we'd better shifted our renewable energy supply um, in the day to other times um, when we need it. Um, and I visualize a sort of ideal, idealized scenario here um, where we've now flattened the demand curve so we don't get those peaks. Um, we've sort of um, spaced out better during the day. We've also added a storage medium that could be an electrochemical storage medium like a battery, or it could be thermal storage like thermal inertia in buildings or refrigerators. <clears throat> and we charge this storage medium during the day when we have a surplus and we discharge it in the morning and the evening uh, when we have that deficit. And um, this approach will reduce system level emissions. Um, now, of course, the problem is much of these systems are regulated by what we call rule-based controllers, which are very sort of rudimentary systems that operate on basic heuristics. So if we're trying to control a building at, let's say, 22 degrees centigrade, when the temperature rises above that, um, that set point, <clears throat> um, the coolers will come on, um, and if it falls below, the heaters will come on and vice versa. And these controllers don't maximise energy efficiency, nor do they interact with the grid to draw power um, when grid carbon intensity is lowest to minimize emissions. So we need new approaches to do this. And I propose um, reinforcement learning as a, a useful method of controlling these systems. Um, so for those unfamiliar, <clears throat> reinforcement learning is a, an algorithmic paradigm for allowing agents to obtain um, control policies uh, in complex environments with no prior knowledge of the system. And it's quite well studied in the sort of building control literature. Um, now the canonical reinforcement learning example our paradigm is um, what we call model free reinforcement learning. Um, here, an agent um, maps a current state to an action um, visualized by this neural network model on the right. <clears throat> um, and it updates its policy by conducting rollouts in the environment visualized on the left, where um, the agent will take action sequentially in the environment to some time horizon H. It will receive a reward, which is a quantification of how good that series of, uh, of actions were at meeting the control objective. And then it will update its policy to take actions that are better at maximizing the cumulative reward over that time horizon. Now, as you can maybe imagine, <clears throat> um, this uh, for, for an agent to obtain a, an optimal policy or a very good policy, it needs to visit all possible states in an environment, ideally, and take all the possible actions it could take. So it covers the, explores the entire state action space. Um, and to do this, it, we often require millions of time steps of data that we can only feed to the agent using a simulator. 
So um, if we want to control a building, we would create a, a building simulator, train the agent in that simulator and deploy it in the real environment. Um, but if we are imagining a scenario where we want to control every building in the world using reinforcement learning, we would need to build a simulator for every building in the world and that's not a scalable solution. So we want to, to look at other techniques for doing this. Another technique is um, what we call model-based reinforcement learning. In this paradigm, we now map, um, on the right-hand side of the screen here, we map a state and an action to a predicted next state. In other words, we're modeling the system dynamics. And if we model this, um, the system dynamics accurately, we can then do what we call planning, where we plan the consequence of several action sequences in our model offline without interacting with the real environment, see the, the action sequence that we think will produce the highest expected reward and then take that take the first action in that sequence in the real environment and in this way we can be much more data efficient and some people in the literature have shown that they can come up with um, building control policies after only a few hours of interaction with the real environment using this technique and um, which is much better than using the millions of time steps that i was referring to earlier so here's a, a sort of a basic summary of the two approaches model free reinforcement learning has the pro of better performance and um, but that comes at the cost of data inefficiency in contrast, model-based approaches are more data efficient, but their performance isn't quite as good. And we see that uh, borne out in the literature where the model-free approaches um, have been shown to produce 30% energy efficiency improvements in buildings, but require years of simulated data. Whereas the model-based approaches um, uh, only require a few hours of training in the real environment, but do not get um, the sort of peak energy efficiency improvements we see with the model free approach. So we would like new approaches that combine the best of both worlds. So get um, high energy efficiency improvements, but use um, little data. And in my work, I propose we can do this using something called probabilistic model-based reinforcement learning. And um, here um, we follow the same schema as the model-based approach I learned before, where we're mapping a state in action to a next state. But now we model a probability distribution over the next state rather than a point prediction and parameterized by some mean mu and some variance sigma. And then we um, plan in a slightly different way. Um, we now um, have one action sequence here we're imagining the consequence of, and we pass it through our models, output distributions, we sample from those distributions, <clears throat> and eventually we get to our time horizon H, and now we will um, achieve a probability distribution over all possible rewards from that action sequence, and we can compare the expected reward of one sequence with others and pick optimal actions. Um, now, we wanted to test how effective this technique is um, when compared with the, the current state of the art um, approaches. And we do that in um, building energy simulations. Um, here, we, we, we test our um, approach against um, the state of the art um, across three simulations. Um, on the left here is a sort of industrial facility in Greece, in the middle, a Spanish apartment building, and on the right, uh, a seminar center in Denmark <clears throat> and we place our agent along with the, the existing state-of-the-art agents in the environment with the goal of minimizing emissions over the course of one year whilst maintaining thermal comfort in the building and um, the only information that the agents fed is what actions it can take they know nothing prior to um, beginning these um, experiments <clears throat> and here are some results and um, so this is um, cumulative emissions over one year for the three buildings, our approach is in green, the existing approaches are um, the other colours, um, and we find that our approach minimises emissions in two of the three buildings, the mixed-use building and the apartment building. In the mixed-use building, <clears throat> we produce 30% less emissions than the current um, rule-based controller, 10% less emissions in the apartment building, and um, we control it almost the same as the existing control in the seminar centre. And we do this whilst maintaining temperature um, better than any of the other approaches. So here, the y-axis is now temperature. We're trying to control within this light green band between 19 and 24 degrees centigrade. And we find that in the apartment building and seminar center, we never go outside that um, temperature bound. We always control within the temperature bound. And in the mixed use facility, we only go outside it um, once in early March. <clears throat> in contrast, the existing state-of-the-art approaches miss the temperature band up to 60% at the time. <clears throat> in the case of the apartment building, um, and you know, 40% uh, of the time, I believe, in the mixed use facility. Okay, to sum up, um, we, know, we know that reducing energy use in heating and cooling systems is a useful climate change mitigation tool. In theory, reinforcement learning allows us to obtain emission reducing control policies for any building with no prior knowledge. Um, existing approaches, however, require training in these hard to obtain simulators that use millions of time steps of data. In contrast, 
our proposed approach, probabilistic model-based reinforcement learning, is easy to deploy. It requires no prior knowledge of the building and can obtain admission reducing control policies after only a few hours of interaction in the real environment. Okay, thanks very much for listening. Um, if you scan that QR code, it takes you to my website where these slides and notes are. Um, and of course, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks very much. That was a fantastic talk, Scott. Um, please do type your questions into the chat. Uh, in the meantime, I have a quick question. Um, what, what is the power, the CPU usage, or uh, are these um, like dynamic programming processes, do, are they sort of processing, he processing heavy? And does, but does it depend on which um, control learning algorithm you're using? And can you, I think this is following on from Keshav saying that data mining and uh, the um, uh, Bitcoin is you know, very eco unfriendly. Um, is there an eco friendly way of doing this? Yeah, okay, so this is a um, excellent question. And something we actually discussed in, um, I discussed in the, the paper we're preparing, but not um, in the presentation. Um, so um, how much CPU do they need? Um, in short, um, not much. I run these simulations on a basic um, Windows PC from 2014. Um, the, our approach, uh, our approach um, requires more CPU than um, the existing um, state of the art. So um, we find that um, on, this, on this hardware I was describing, um, my algorithm can select an action. It takes about one second of compute time on this old hardware to select an action, um, which is about um, 10 times slower than um, existing approaches. Um, but this isn't, uh, we don't foresee this as a sort of problem because um, in a real environment, you would select a control action every sort of three minutes. Um, so you require one second of compute every three minutes. Um, so that's not sort of um, hampering performance. Um, but then, um, you know, if you're asking um, more generally about like the, you know, the, the carbon emissions associated with compute in data centers, and um, that's not something I've looked at. Um, but, um, you know, as Keshav alluded to in his, in his uh, presentation, um, I don't know, we, we seem like, uh, we don't seem too concerned about the compute power of um, data centers as they're sort of becoming more efficient through time. <laughs> I was just interested in the computing, the, the, sorry, the um, CPU usage for reinforcement learning as a, a subset of AI in general, but and oh. not not like the whole lot yet. But yeah, I agree. I guess it, it, it it's going to probably start being taken into consideration when people think about what the energy usage of all digital processes is. When you know, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really reassuring in Keshav's talk where he said that actually ICT processes are, it's a bit of a red herring to, to chase that. Um, there's other industrial processes to consider. Yeah. Well, just if you let me follow up on that actually quickly, um, talking about reinforcement learning more generally, um, you know, this, this stuff has been kind of pioneered by DeepMind and Google, as many of you may know, um, building models that learn to play games like Go and, and um, complicated, um, doing sort of complicated tasks. And they trained a lot of these model free algorithms using literally billions of time steps of data over weeks and months. Um, and that pre training process is like energy inefficient. And um, what I'm describing here is a process that learns online after a few hours um, um, using these model based techniques, um, which you could, you know, I, I would argue is a sort of more um, energy efficient way of training these models. <clears throat> Okay, brilliant. Uh, a quick, we've got a question from Eric in the chat. How do you see this approach being rolled out at scale, for example, to all housing stock across the UK? What would be required to do this on a national scale? Yeah, um, another good question. Um, so, okay, so this is uh, um, an unanswered question that I hope to answer through the remainder of my PhD, Eric, um, and it's an important one. Um, the, the, the primary unanswered question is, um, what sensors do we need in the building to do this? And what um, sensors, and where would we deploy these sensors in the building? So these building energy simulations I, I showed in my talk <clears throat> um, have some fairly basic, um, it's fairly basic sensors in the building. So it's like internal temperature, external temperature, pressure, humidity, um, and some um, sensors that sort of measure demand. So like when people turn off and on radiators and cooling. Um, but it's an unanswered question like, um, how can we minimize how many sensors in the building? Like if we minimize sensors, do we still get the same performance? If we add more sensors, do we get better performance? And this is something that I, I, I want to look into. And I think that's like the, 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 the main sort of next step for my work. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Scott. Really fantastic talk.
Um, okay, our next speaker is Joycelyn Longton. Joycelyn is at the Department of Computer Science and her research uses AI to address climate resistance. And she's got a brilliant talk title, Monitoring Ghanaian Forests with Machine Learning, Bioacoustics and Indigenous Knowledge. So Joycelyn, it's all yours. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, yep, yeah, I won't repeat my PhD uh, title um, as Lata has just said it, but um, yeah, I'm also here with my co-supervisor, uh, Jennifer. So hi, Jennifer. And my talk, I guess, will also um, link back to a few of the concepts that Jennifer brought up in her talk, but um, also looking at it from a technical machine learning perspective as well. Um, so I'll move on. Um, so just starting with um, motivation and, and context that is really foundational to um, my PhD and uh, just to note I'm sort of a month and a half in so this is focusing more so on my proposal and the work that I'm currently doing um, and will be doing in the next year, year and a half, two years. Um, so yeah, Ghana ranks third out of 65 African nations on tropical deforestation rate and um, I'm assuming that, you know, we're, we're probably quite familiar with the importance of forests, um, especially tropical forests in terms of um, carbon sequestration, um, biodiversity um, value, um, and, and as a tool in general for uh, climate mitigation. Um, and the reason why Ghana is interesting is that it's recognised as one of the most advanced tropical African countries um, in terms of established forest policy and management. Um, However, it, it has these incredibly high uh, deforestation rates. And monitoring specifically is an essential practice um, that can reveal uh, long-term trends, contribute to knowledge and inform environmental planning and policy. So in this field, remote sensing and machine learning have emerged as incredibly invaluable tools in understanding and monitoring forests, ecosystems, um, with the acquisition of image data and subsequent computer vision analysis and being used widely. And, and I did a lot of this work um, in my MRES last year. But although incredibly powerful, um, these uh, sort of more computer vision methods are limited by lack of ground truth data um, for validation, especially in data scarce regions um, such as Africa, and uh, are also limited by a restriction of field of view. So being able to, being unable to monitor below the forest canopy, um, as well as a low temporal resolution. So from a computing perspective, my PhD project will undertake bioacoustic monitoring combined with deep learning um, models such as convolutional, convolutional neural net networks um, to remotely and automatically monitor forests. Um, and, and the use of bioacoustics is interesting here because it tells you not only what is happening, but um, can give more insight into why and when. So my project will involve um, embedding acoustic sensors within the forest canopy to obtain ecosystem soundscapes. Um, and this will be followed by subsequent performance of classification tasks to identify um, either anthropogen anthropogenic disturbance events um, or um, where it's looking to go uh, more so is understanding how the health um, of the forest and how biodiversity um, changes or is impacted by these anthropogenic um, instances. Um, but importantly for, for my project, um, understanding forest dynamics is not just a question of technology or science, um, and as well as the environmental impacts caused by deforestation in um, Ghana, but more generally uh, across the tropics, um, the social, economic and cultural importance of forests, for forest fringe communities uh, especially, but also for local communities, um, local villages, has been destabilised. Um, and whilst the vast majority of this sort of conservation research is centred on indigenous lands in the tropics, um, most of these projects, um, you mentioned red earlier on, um, kind of operate at a, a significant remove from indigenous communities themselves. Um, so even though indigenous knowledge is often a subject of scientific study, um, or there are collaborative or community-based projects, rarely does the community themselves influence or, um, or design or lead on the scientific process. I mean, this has led to traditional practices often being disrespected or under-promoted in 
conservation. So although remote sensing and machine learning techniques have supported scalability within the field uh, of forest conservation, these methods can uh, even more so widen the disconnect between conservation projects and indigenous communities and weaken important links um, and connections to essential local knowledge. And so whilst critical approaches to research greatly influences the social sciences, um, you know, acknowledgements of uh, biases based on sex, race, class, and other sort of arbitrary categories. Um, these kind of methods have yet to emerge from the margins within the physical and computer sciences. And the objectives of these methods, um, for example, Linda Tawai Smith's um, decolonizing methodologies, is to really recenter theory and practices without privileging one knowledge system over the other. So, uh, without privileging Western science. Um, over indigenous science or other knowledge systems um, and really sort of observing a proper inclusion um, and involvement of host stakeholders um, at the community level. So from this critical lens um, and influenced by um, literature such as critical technical practice, this project will also develop and implement a framework which builds on established conservation, machine learning and bioacoustic methods but one that explores new modes of scientific inquiry and addresses AI ethics from a technical perspective um, uh, with the goal of repositioning machine learning as an important tool in ecology, but through a co-creation and collaboration lens. So there are, to wrap that up in, in terms of my objectives, um, I'll be looking to apply um, both unsupervised um, and supervised machine learning techniques, but really in the in the near future, in the next year, focusing on unsupervised um, methods to identify um, uh, deforestation and degradation events, and to um, understand and gain insights on forest health and biodiversity. And I'll go into a little bit more depth in in, in a little while. Um, also to investigate the biodiversity and health of Ghanaian forests and the intersection specifically of um, biodiversity and forest health indicators between indigenous knowledge and machine learning analysis. And in general, to develop uh, an ethical AI and forest conservation framework through this collaborative practice um, with local communities and stakeholders. So um, my methods at this stage uh, that I'm planning um, can fall into sort of three broad topics. Um, and these are sort of um, motivated and founded on um, human computer interaction um, approaches um, and ICT for development methodologies. Um, so the project will really be looking to retrieve insights um, from this novel application of already uh, developed machine learning architectures. So uh, one key part of the project is uh, community co-design. And this stage of the project will um, take uh, input and follow um, the methods of approaches such as community citizen science, which is a model of citizen science that embraces um, participatory democracy. So through ethnographic fieldwork, um, workshops, interviews, um, community members will really frame the key points of inquiry, um, co-design sensor deployment, um, and facilitate the identification of culturally important species um, and provide a better understanding of historical indigenous forest um, management techniques. Um, so following on from, uh, oh, and I forgot to mention that in, in that community co-design um, section, uh, importantly will be a acoustic pilot, which is um, incredibly important and, and standard for acoustic bioacoustic projects. So uh, using that time with the community to understand different um, sensor configurations and distributions within the field sites, understanding uh, what will be the best um, uh, recording schedule um, for, the culture, for um, identifying culturally um, important species um, and doing playback uh, experiments. So um, understanding the um, extent to which the sensors are, are, are working well um, in the specific environment. Um, so moving on from this acoustic pilot, um, which will be implemented in collaboration with the community members and local partners, 
um, the acoustic sensors will be deployed um, in the forest canopy for continuous monitoring and data collection. So initially, um, I'll explore unsupervised techniques. Um, following uh, closely um, the work from Sethi et al, um, who used the general purpose convolutional neural network to provide an automated analysis of the collected soundscapes. Um, and uh, they sort of um, refer to these as the general soundscape fingerprints. And these fingerprints can be used to predict habitat quality and species richness. And the acoustic um, feature embeddings will be investigated to determine ecological, spatial and temporal dynamics. So uh, we can see here in this, um, in these top uh, images, these are um, clusterings of the different soundscapes, different um, um, embeddings of five minute soundscapes. Um, uh, and, and these clusterings can be also compared to um, the on the ground um, uh, ideas around uh, forest health and, and biodiversity and cultural importance um, as well. And continuing with the unsupervised method, um, it can also be used to identify anomalous sounds like chainsaws and other um, anthropogenic uh, sounds. An example of one of these methods is the VG Gish architecture, which is pre-trained on Google's audio set project, so avoiding um, quite intense um, training data collection. So here the acoustic data are embedded in a high dimensional feature space um, and then a site specific anomaly scoring algorithm, which uses a Gaussian mixture model um, can characterize the most typical forest sounds um, and allowing for anthropogenic activity to be identified. Um, and this is important um, for the next, for um, other parts, of the project, um, so more specifically classification of specific species and culturally important species and keystone species. Um, so using more traditional supervised methods, a species classifier can be built. Um, and this can, can, the insights from that can be combined with the unsupervised uh, anomaly detection to understand um, really the distribution of that species, where is that species, um, uh, moving to? Uh, are there any blockages for parts of the forest uh, that they're not moving to? And, and how do those overlap with areas of higher anthropogenic um, activity? So, um, one minute. Great. Um, yeah, so in terms of outcomes and contributions, um, sort of each stage of the project, um, mainly I focus on the first year and a half, two years, but uh, can um, support new learnings within HCI fields. Um, and using my sort of already established platform where I speak publicly and engage um, general public um, and work with arts institutions, um, there'll be a focus on communicating the research and facilitating more reflective engagement um, as part of the study itself rather than the process added on the end. And um, lastly, legacy is incredibly important to this project. So avoiding helicopter science and really looking to the future of policy in the region, as well as um, monitoring, monitoring tools for the future. Um, so thank you for listening and happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Joyce Lynn. That was a really illuminating talk. I, I didn't know that there was acrimony between forest communities and like formal conservation practices, and that they might even like ignore forest community practices so that's like quite shocking for me um there's a question in the chat from keshav um he says uh, i know very little about knowledge elicitation from indigenous communities but it seems to me that such communities do not typically codify knowledge in books for example how do you plan to access this knowledge and how can you resolve conflicting claims by different practitioners mm -hmm. yeah that's a really important point and i guess it's a really key part of my project in itself is that um we can't just uh, rely on um, more accepted Western forms of knowledge um, expression and that um, actually communicating, so I'll be um, doing field work. And so communicating with uh, communities, the workshops and the whole co-design process is to understand um, not just from specific individuals, but from communities and stakeholders in general, um, what is the knowledge and how, and how, and what are those conflicts? Because those conflicts, um, also shouldn't be shied away from its understanding what it because those conflicts also lead to um sort of confusion within the space as well for example 
in Ghana, there are local communities who um, will engage in deforestation uh, activities um, for their own livelihoods or for economic reasons. And they're also the same communities who um, suffer the effects of uh, those actions. And so understanding where these conflicts arise um, can actually give really good insights into further policy and implementation. So it's really looking to understand this knowledge, not just through books or remotely or through papers, because um, inherently systematic uh, biases um, and barriers for those um, knowledges to come through uh, will, will um, be perpetuated. And it's really about uh, looking at new um, forms of knowledge sharing uh, and, and knowledge exchange. Brilliant, Jocelyn. Um, there are a couple more questions in the chat if you want to head off into that and give them um, some written answers. Thank you very okay, cool. much for a brilliant talk. Um, our next Thank speaker you. is Simon Thomas. Um, Simon, it, uh, he's a student at the British Antarctic Survey and his research interests include understanding tropical cyclone storms. And Simon's uh, talk is entitled Defining Southern Ocean Fronts Using Unsupervised Classification. So if you're ready, Simon, you can go. Great. Uh, thanks a lot for introducing me. Uh, so today I'm, I'm going to be talking about um, a paper that we've just released um, in the Ocean Science Journal uh, from EGU. Uh, so uh, this is work I've done in collaboration with a number of people, including Eric Mackey, who's here today, um, and that we've done over the last couple of years. Um, so first to uh, dive in. So um, first, I, I guess not many of you, or probably um, none of you, are oceanographers, apart from Eric. Uh, so I thought a brief overview of what the ocean looks like. So this is a really nice image um, from NASA of the um, ocean currents um, as lines on this map and from a particular snapshot. And the colors on those uh, lines are the, uh, the ocean temperatures from that point in time. And what you can see is that you've got a very complex, complicated structure. Uh, you've got things like these um, Agulhas rings that come off from uh, South Africa um, and propagate across the uh, South Atlantic, and you've also got um, this filamented structure. In this talk, we're obviously focusing on the Southern Ocean, which is this this sort of ocean um, that obviously is just above Antarctica, um, and it's unique because it's the only place in the world where you can get um, ocean currents going the, the whole way around um, and in an unobstructed way, and that leads to uh, something called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, which is the largest current in the world, and that sort of uh, goes around the um, yeah, around the whole continent and sort of in some way um, insulates Antarctica, uh, at least um, from ocean heat transport in, to some extent. Uh, so uh, one of the things that uh, you, you would notice if you went uh, from, from the north to the south, and, and they noticed in the original voyages to Antarctica, was that the uh, water doesn't uh, cool down continuously as, you, as you're approaching Antarctica, it actually sort of steps down, and there are uh, features which um, uh, seem like uh, fronts, um, and they're called fronts uh, in analogy to the atmosphere, um, where the uh, ocean becomes suddenly colder. So uh, obviously in, in the atmosphere, you, you get nice fronts drawn on your weather maps by meteorologists if you, if you look at those, and those really help, help you interpret uh, what's going on and what, what the weather's going to be like for you. Uh, so obviously when, when a front passes over us, uh, normally the weather changes quite abruptly because those, those two air masses have been uh, changed over and suddenly things are quite different. Um, so in the Southern Ocean, there's, there's been a, uh, a quite lively discussion recently about what the def best definition might be. Um, obviously in the past, we had very limited data because you know, to go to the Southern Ocean, you'd have to get in sort of a sailing ship or whatever and uh, go all the way down to the Antarctica and it would take a very long time. So we had very um, limited disconnected data um, and the model we sort of Settle on um, to some extent was um, that there were about three uh, circumpolar currents, uh, circumpolar fronts, even uh, that went around Antarctica, as shown in the left hand figure, um, and that these were relatively static and didn't um, and could be sort of easily defined. Um, but this has been challenged because obviously um, we now have a lot more data, and so as we can get a much more sort of nu nuanced view of what those fronts look like. Um, and actually, if you look at a particular property, um, so if you look at, say, the sea surface height gradient, which you can measure from the, uh, the new satellites that they've um, put up there in the last 30 years, 
uh, then you can then look at um, the gradient in that. You can see that um, although there are suddenly these features where things step down, they're not necessarily continuous um, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, yeah, so, so uh, the, the question here was whether we could do something um, which um, both provided the ability for oceanographers to be able to talk about um, certain regions of the ocean as distinct and uh, looked look to see whether there were ways in which we could uh, automatically assign water masses and therefore the boundaries between those water masses and the, the, those um, areas. So uh, that's what we have tried to do in this work. Um, so to get a sense of the data that we're using, we're using a state estimate product and I've got the, uh, we're using the temperature and the salinity, which are the two key properties um, in the ocean and um, in the physical oceanography because they determine uh, the density of the water. Um, and so if we look at uh, the time uh, period um, in this animation, uh, yeah, you can see that uh, these uh, gradually change through time as they're mixed by uh, the currents. And you can see things like the um, Ukula Springs coming off of uh, South Africa and so on. And so we, we don't just use um, one particular depth level. In this work, we're using uh, several depth levels from 300 meters to 2000 meters to get a sense of the, uh, the structure of the profile overall, so that we could sort of understand, um, you know, the, what, what the structure of that Southern Ocean uh, is, that piece of the Southern Ocean is. Um, and, oh, sorry, uh, what we do, which is quite a common technique in uh, machine learning, obviously, is just to first apply principal component analysis, which is essentially trying to explain your data in the smallest number of, um, of features. Uh, and so most of it is explained by, in PC1, by, uh, just a simple south to north um, cold to hot contrast. And in the subsequent principal components, uh, less is explained. And in this particular study, we use three. Um, and to explain the algorithm we're using, um, we're uh, using Gaussian mixed modeling, which is quite a popular uh, algorithm in um, machine learning. Uh, so to try and um, estimate uh, the number of classes that we need from the data and then fit them empirically to use, through using expectation maximization. So the plot on the left-hand side um, uh, is clustering uh, just in 2D space. So we've got um, these five clusters and you can see that uh, it, uh, we, we can hard label each of the points uh, based on which, which cluster it's most likely to be part of. Um, on the right-hand side, there's the corresponding uh, Gaussians um, that are underlying it and causing it to be labeled. Uh, what we added to this study um, thanks to Manita Pal, was uh, just a, a method of highlighting the boundary between uh, w w where there was some uncertainty, which we called the I metric, which essentially is um, the probability that it's, it's um, well, that we at least interpret in this case, that it's the property that it's part of a front um, and it has the units of probability. So um, essentially it, it highlights um, the boundaries between these two clusters and therefore, um, where things are potentially changing according to our model. Um, so to show what this looks like in um, geographic space and compare this to the previous um, understandings of fronts that people have used, um, then on the left-hand side, we've got this uh, in physical space and, and this picks out the uh, circumpolar Antarctic structure quite well. Um, and then on the right-hand side, obviously we've got the I metric, um, which we can uh, highlight in different colors based on which two clusters it's going between. And you can see that it's quite similar uh, to uh, before. I'll just check the chat. Yep, uh, right. Uh, quite similar to the, the lines that I've laid on top. So where we've got the, uh, the fronts which have been determined using uh, sea surface height contours. And, um, but the difference is that um, because it's uh, a probabilistic method, then we at least have some estimation of the uncertainty and where the fronts are. And also that instead of using surface properties, uh, like in the previous studies, um, then we've, we've used properties which are um, estimated from the, um, the properties between 300 and 2000 meters. Um, so th that's another difference, which um, hopefully will make the, the results uh, slightly more robust. Um, so we could also look at see how this how the fronts uh, move over time, and these are obviously um, mixed um, and moved by the Antarctic circumpolar current as that evolves. Um, 
right? So I should probably um, go on. So we, we can actually quantify this um, and show that this is consistent with our physical knowledge. So we, we could use look, look at this um, I metric, this uh, as a, a scalar value, sorry. Um, and look at, um, so on the left-hand side, this is just a single uh, time shot um, for one particular month, uh, where you can see that the frontal features are quite uh, sharp, um, as you can see there um, in places, um, and more diffuse than others. But over time, um, in some areas, those, those fronts move about so much that they, um, they blur out over time because they're not um, constrained by the uh, seafloor, whereas in other areas, they're quite tightly constrained by the seafloor and then therefore um, they remain uh, quite visible um, in the time average. Uh, so to summarize this work, so we've produced a new fairly interpretable method, um, which anyone can use in it. The um, code is freely available online for people to apply to their own sets. Um, and the paper is um, shown below, which you can access. Um, so yeah, I, I would welcome any questions about it. Thank you, Simon. Fantastic. Um, are there any questions to be put into the chat? And uh, while, while you're thinking questions up for Simon, maybe I can ask a very quick one. Um, uh, I, I think that what <laughs> what most of us know, know who, are, who are not working with PASS is that the circumpolar current is what keeps the ice sheet frozen. Do you, can you um, just g give a summary of what kind of implications there are for climate change and like, you know, if there are any <laughs> disruptions to the current, um, you know, what's likely to happen and what kind of time scale would we imagine that to happen given current um, CO2 levels? Um, yeah, I, I mean, obviously I'm not, I'm not an expert on this. Sorry, I think I may, maybe missed out a few words at the start of my presentation. Uh, so yeah, obviously the, the sudden notion is very important. Um, it's actually, uh, there've been papers recently analyzing the CMEP and models which show that um, at least in CMIP 5, uh, although the Southern Ocean only takes up about 30% of the um, the ocean surface, it actually took up 75% of the heat um, or, or, as a result of anthropogenic carbon emissions. Um, and it also took up um, over 40% of the carbon dioxide that was taken up by the ocean. Um, and that's because of some of the unique properties of the Southern Ocean in that um, uh, it, it creates water, which is then, um, which then sinks uh, to the ocean's interior. Um, so I, I guess we're not entirely sure um, how the Antarctic circumpolar would change, current would change um, due to climate change uh, necessarily. Um, obviously, the, there are fairly drastic things that people in the past have presented, where obviously there, there are, uh, say, the ice sheet um, instabilities um, that are, should uh, worry us all. But I don't think I can offer a particularly intelligent comment. Sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. We have a quick question from Eric. In the results you showed, you set it to five clusters, but what would the results look like if we used a different number of clusters? Yeah, so, so this is a, a good uh, comment. So, so there was there was some problem with the, the sort of uh, choosing the right number of clusters to choose essentially the, the complexity of your statistical model um, to which is, is also a problem with a lot of the other methods in that you always have to choose some sort of threshold value, which in some ways is subjective. This, this um, it tends to move it about so that you, uh, the, the fronts themselves tend to uh, locate themselves in similar places because there are certain places which, um, where the properties are changing relatively quickly and therefore the algorithm um, has less points in that particular space and therefore it chooses to put the boundary there. Um, so, but there is some variability between the different versions and so uh, potentially that's something that future work should build on is is trying to find uh, ways to reduce that subjectivity um, and reduce its um, sensitivity to the number of clusters and um, potentially by using uh, different inputs uh, using potential volatility and this is actually work that um, I think Nestle is doing at the maths department for her PhD um, at least for sub -meso scale fronts so hopefully she'll solve this problem yeah Thanks, Simon. I mean, yeah, I wonder even if you could build some kind of algorithm that was able to have different numbers of clusters in different locations around a sudden ocean, depending on like, because you could, it should, it, the research kind of shows that you have areas where there are more fronts or where the fronts split out into more different segments and, and areas where, there are, where they're more confined into a smaller number. Anyway. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, well. Okay, thank you, Simon. That is really beautiful work. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks to all of our keynote speakers today. 
uh, Marcus Kraft, Srinivasan Keshav, and Jennifer Gabris uh, for just really wonderful talks to explore how to use um, apply AI to sustainability challenges that we've got and those in the future as well. And huge thanks to all of our early career speakers for fantastic talks, Yen Feng, uh, Scott, Jocelyn, and Simon. And thanks to Cambridge Zero's Eric Mackey for organizing this really illuminating series of research symposia, which I think have been so brilliant this term. And thanks to our audience for your fantastic questions as well. So please do join us on the 24th of November at three o'clock for a research symposium on how to decarbonize hard to abate sectors which will um, include uh, keynote speaker Rob Miller, D director of the Whittle Lab. Um, so thank you very much to everybody and uh, have a good evening. Thanks, thanks everyone. And thanks Lata for chairing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Bye-bye.